Good morning to my POL family. Are you thankful to be in the house of God? David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Now that's a good preacher cliche and it's, um, preachers use it just like I just did when, you know, you're trying to get the, the crowd pumped up. But if I'm being really honest with you, I'm not always glad to go to the house of the Lord. I'm just, I'm being real with you here today. There's sometimes when I've had a stressful week, there's sometimes when I've had a lot going and we can relate to that. You've had busyness and, and the week is just a blur and you just really don't feel like going to the house of the Lord. You wake up and the alarm goes off and you're just like, oh man, I would just love to just hit the snooze and stay in bed and I don't want to get up and speak at the nine o'clock service. Oh my goodness, I'm nervous and it's just, it's, uh, I just really don't feel like going. However, in those moments when I have felt that, when I have thought that, and I push myself, and I somehow find a way to get to the house of God, and when I start to feel his presence, and when I start to feel that healing power of Jesus, that's when I start to get glad. And I can tell you here today that there is not one time that when I did push myself and when I did find a way to get to the house of God, that by the time I left the house of God, that I was not glad. I've been glad every time. If God's done anything for you, I think it would be okay for just the next few seconds. Let's give him a hand clap of praise, an ovation of praise, just to say thank you, God. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for lifting me up, God. Thank you for strengthening me, God, when I was weak. We thank you, Jesus. We give you praise today, Lord. We glorify your name. Thank you for being an all-powerful God. Thank you for never leaving us, for never forsaking us. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. What an awesome presence of God that is here. So thankful to be here. I just want to say I love this church. Cassie and I have found this to be such a great place of healing, a great place of restoration for us. This church is exactly what we've needed, and, uh, and we love this church. We love coming here. We love being a part. We love the friends that we've made. We love the friends. We're looking forward to the friends that we're going to make, um, hoping that maybe uh, we can hang out in a connect group. Yes, I wasn't going to get up here and not put in a little plug for connect groups. Okay, this is my opportunity. I don't know when I'm going to be up here again. So listen, if y'all aren't part of a connect group, if y'all aren't attending one or leading one, you've got to get involved. You don't know what you're missing. I'm telling you, and again, I know I referenced it just now that we're all busy, and I get it, that, that we're all very, very busy, but I'm telling you, I've got to know people that maybe I've just waved at or said hi to at church, but I've got to know them better, and it's just so awesome to form community in your church. It's so awesome that when you walk into the sanctuary on a Sunday morning, and you're like, oh, there's, there's so-and-so. Oh, yeah, I remember. I just learned something about them, and then you go and talk to them, and you know, you find out that they're a way better golfer than you, or you know, just whatever it might be, um, and, uh, but it's just so awesome. It's so awesome to, uh, to unify us in the day and age that we live with the evils that are in the world. World, we need each other. We need community. We need unity. And so connect groups are going to do that. And so please get involved. I, I promise you, uh, if you want to lead a connect group, uh, see me or Cassie, and, um, and we want to get you involved. And if you want to attend a connect group, we definitely want to get everyone involved and get everyone unified. So, so excited about what God's going to do. I want to give honor to our pastor. Uh, so thankful for this opportunity. I don't take it lightly. So, Pastor, thank you for, uh, for the opportunity. I'm so thankful for our pastoral staff. We have an amazing pastoral staff and leaders in this church. We should not take that lightly. Awesome leadership in this church and so thankful and excited to see what God is going to do. So this month we are diving into a series that's called The Everyday Church. And I want to stop for just a minute and I want to give honor uh, to another one of our, our leaders and ministers, Brother Walton. He did such an amazing job last Sunday <laughs> with opening this series. In fact, he did almost too good of a job. When I saw the, the speaker schedule, I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to follow Brother Walton? Wow. Those are big shoes to fill, but no, amazing job, Brother Walton. So thankful uh, for uh, what you do for our church and what you're doing for the kingdom of God. So we are diving into a series that's called The Everyday Church, and this series is going to help us to learn or maybe relearn some biblical steps 
that will help build us into the disciples that we are all called to be. And so this is not something that is dramatic. These are the steps that we're going to have to take to get to become the everyday church. It's not anything that's dramatic. It's not something that's going to be a quick fix. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. None of these steps are going to work if we only do them sporadically. If we only treat this like, let's say, a New Year's resolution. We all know what those are like. Oh, I'm going on a diet. I mean, this, this is the time. I'm going to, this, this particular time is, I know I've done it in the past, but this is going to be the time, or I'm going to exercise, or I'm going to, you know, just do whatever it is that you can fill in the blank for all the, you know, hundreds of thousands of New Year's resolutions that we've all had. And then, you know, two weeks, a month goes by, and you start to kind of skip here and there, and then before long, it's, it's like, what was that commitment again? I need to, did I write it down somewhere? I don't even remember. Uh, what diet? And so we can't sporadically or just haphazardly commit to this. It's something that we're going to have to wake up every day and say, you know what, I'm committed to this. Doesn't matter what's going on in my life. Doesn't matter what I'm facing that particular day. Doesn't matter what my mindset is. I'm committed to this. All of these steps are powerful if we just take a few minutes every day to invest strategically in the only part of our life that will actually outlive our life. So I want to stop for a minute. I want you to think about that. The only part of our life that will outlive our life. So what are we talking about there? We're talking about eternal implications. We're talking about something that is going to outlive us, that is going to outlive our, our children, that is going to outlive our grandchildren. We're talking about eternity. And when you say it with that perspective, it changes everything. It, it brings the level of importance to a whole nother level because we're talking about eternity. And we're talking about the lives of people and their eternal lives. Now, let's be honest. There are some things that you just need to do every day, right? Okay, so things like eating, all right? So you wake up in the morning and you eat breakfast for all those. And I know everyone has different perspectives and different, you know, level of importance on, okay, I, I have to eat a, a strong, heavy breakfast to get my day going. I need, you know, my tank filled. And then other people, no, I like to skip breakfast. Boy, I need to do some intermittent fasting, and uh, lunch is my, my time. Or, or some, for some, it may be dinner. I just need, I work with a guy that he says, you need to eat just one good meal a day. And so he eats a, a big dinner uh, every evening. So, But whatever it is that's your preference or what's good for your body or just what you like, I think we can all agree that you have to eat every day, right? That's an essential. That's very important. Or things like getting dressed. That's very important. For anyone that decides to skip that one, you might stand out in the crowd just a little bit. You know, if people are looking at you, you might get the kind of attention that you don't want to get. So it's very important to get dressed every day, okay? These are stating the obvious, but it's so true. Things like taking a shower, taking a bath, brushing your teeth putting on deodorant. These things are very important. Now I'm getting down to where we live, right? And you can tell, so if someone decided that they wanted to skip one of these, okay, but they're not going to tell anyone. I'm just, I, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm not going to be committed to that today. I just, uh, I'm going to kind of just breeze over that one today, and, and they don't tell anyone. But the sad part is with some of these things that I've mentioned, you don't have to tell anyone. It's not going to be kept a secret. You know, we talk about the speed of light, okay? You, you hear about that, and you hear statistics, and I didn't bring any with me here today, but just how amazing and, and the numbers of how quick the speed of light is. And, and for all of you uh, uh, sports cars lovers, you know, you hear about the latest sports car that has this particular engine and horsepower, and it can go from zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds or whatever, and, and so we're all blown away and amazed by this. But what we don't talk often enough about is the speed of smell, and I can promise you that if you come across someone that has skipped brushing their teeth or skipped putting on deodorant, you don't need to hear any statistics quoted to you. You are going to get firsthand knowledge and experience with the speed of smell and how quick it is. Now, they say confession is good for the soul. So I'm going to share with you one here today, and I'm just going to open my heart. I'm just tearing myself open, and I'm going to share something with y'all here today. And y'all are going to get to know me in a way that you didn't think you would whether you want to or not. So Cassie and I, we uh, decided a couple of years ago to buy a house that was built in the 70s, 
And um, so we're remodeling it, and it's had some acreage, and we recently bought a little extra property as if we didn't have enough work to do. Let's just add a little more to it. And so now we have about 11 acres of land, and we've got an old house that we're fixing up. And, um, and so you can just about imagine, just with a, an old house that needs to be remodeled and 11 acres, need I say any more, with what we are doing. We're mowing grass, we're, we're doing property development, we're doing house development and, and, and demo and reno and all of this kind of stuff, okay? And so there was a, there's been many days in recent time where I've been busy. I mean, talk about being busy earlier. I've been crazy busy where my day has just been a blur. I can't even tell you what happened and working hard and sweating and I mean my clothes are just drenched and there was a particular day where Y'all, I was busy. I mean, I was just so, I had 83,000 things going. I was, I was working outside. I was sweating. I was going to run this errand. I seemed to live at Lowe's and Home Depot all the time. That's like my second home. And so, and it was just, I was just like, just going crazy. And I, so as the day uh, goes on, you know, I, I can feel that my body's just shutting down and I'm tired. Mentally, I'm just exhausted. And, and so, you know, night falls and it's probably even a little earlier than my normal bedtime, but I'm like, my bedtime is coming fastly approaching that I'm just, I'm about to just shut down. And so I, I, I felt like I had just enough energy, just enough energy to take a shower, you know, and to, to clean up. Okay. I, I at least did that. But then it was like, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I've got out of the shower, and so I've, I've got my bed clothes on, and I'm like, you know what? I just, I, I thought, okay, brushing my teeth. I don't know if I have enough energy. I really don't. I mean, it might only take just a minute or two, but I'm telling y'all, I was that tired. So, y'all, I am here today to confess to y'all that I decided, I made a, a decision that could impact the rest of my life. I don't know, but I did not brush my teeth that night before I went to bed. I went to bed, I laid in bed without brushing my teeth. And, you know, I can, I can tell you that a kiss goodnight from Cassie was not in the cards. That was not going to happen. Even a goodnight hug was not going to happen. I was going to be lucky if I could just get a goodnight wave from across the room. Okay, babe, I love you from 20 feet away. As soon as you find your toothbrush, I'll get a little closer. So, men, if you feel like your wife's avoiding you, Maybe if you, you know, just brush your teeth a little more, that might kind of improve things just a little bit. But things, we're talking about things that we do every day, things that are essential every day. So I've had a little fun here today, but, but seriously, there, there are certain things that in our lives that we do every day, um, things that just aren't, um, aren't an option. And, and sometimes when we don't feel like it, we still do them. So there's a message in there that, you know, when we're tired, and when we don't really want to do a certain thing, we still do it because in our mind, we've committed to it, and we realize that that's something that is essential and is, and is important. Last week, uh, Brother Walton, again, did such an awesome job, but he gave us uh, five uh, discipleship habits. The first one is enlist, which has to do with our ministry. The second one is our voice, which has to do with prayer. The third one is extend, which has to do with evangelism. The fourth is read, which of course has to do with the Bible. And the fifth one is yield, which is our time, talent, and treasure. Now, I kind of quickly went through those, but we are going to do a deep dive on those in the coming weeks. And so I'm excited about uh, hearing more about that. But today, I am going to talk about the first one, which is to enlist. And so what do, we t what do we mean when we say enlist? This is talking about our ministry. It's talking about our involvement, our, our service to the kingdom of God, or our part, if you will. What is our part? What part do I play? What part do you play in God's economy? The first century church impacted their world, not just because of their doctrine, but because of what they did with what they believed. So it wasn't just something verbal. It wasn't just something that they thought or something, well, I believe this, but it was something that they actually put into action. Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord added to the church daily, not just uh, every couple of weeks. Oh, I, I'm really motivated this particular day. Okay, I'll do it. But, but then, you know, a few days will go by and I, I'm kind of tired or whatever. No, it says the Lord added to the church daily precisely because his people did these things daily. So God stepped up and did things daily because the people, the, the, the disciples and the, the ministers who were committed to this were committed 
daily. Whether they felt like it or not, they stepped up and did it. They continued steadfastly in these habits without a break every day. Every apostolic church in the 21st century, including POL, every church has an opportunity to have a revival just like the first century church did. But it's not going to happen just because we preach the same doctrine. Yes, that's important, but it's not going to happen just on that alone. It, it, it only happens when we have the same level of discipleship, when we have the same level of involvement and the same level of taking action. It will not happen because we make one commitment in one service. We've all had those times uh, in our lives, and I can remember many. Maybe it was when you were younger and you had a youth camp experience, or maybe it was a camp meeting experience, or, or a particular service uh, at, at POL where you heard a sermon preached, and it really touched your heart. It really uh, motivated you in that moment, and you said, you know what, God? I felt like that was your voice, and I'm going to answer that calling, and I'm going to step up. And, and we feel very motivated and committed in one particular moment in time in our life. And then as, as the days and weeks go by, you know, we try to hold on to that commitment. But it was more so uh, about a, a particular ministry moment that we just felt really good, but then it wasn't really anything that was life-changing to where we, we developed a commitment that would last. And so we can think of those times, and, and what we're talking about here today, being the everyday church, is not just a particular moment that gave you a good feeling, and then you eventually move on from it, and then you, you look for the next good feeling. That's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about what, no matter how you feel, you say, you wake up every morning and you say, you know what? I'm committed to this, God. I'm looking for a need today. Let me be sensitive to the people around me. Let me, let me listen for your voice, God. Lead and guide me every day in how you want me to, to go and the decisions that you want me to make. It will only happen if we live this every day. Acts chapter 17, verse 6 says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And then in Acts chapter 26 and verse 26, giving examples of this commitment that we're talking about here today. Acts chapter 26 verse 26 says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. In these scripture references that I gave, how are they able to accomplish such a saturation of the gospel in their culture? How are they able to accomplish this? It's because everyone every day exercised their ministry. Whether it was a good day, whether it was a bad day, whether it was a slow day and they felt, uh, you know, just like it, they didn't have much motivation or whether it was a busy day and they were extremely distracted, everyone every day exercised their ministry. It didn't matter. Paul explained how ministry is supposed to work in the letter uh, to the church of, of Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4 beginning at verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles... And some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all know uh, about this particular scripture reference. We call verse 11 the fivefold ministry. So these are the offices that lead the apostolic church, all of the, the ones that were mentioned in verse 11. But we often mistake verse 12 to be the threefold ministry of the fivefold ministry, if you will. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we hear that scriptures too often, and we think that they're they're listing the fivefold ministry and then what the fivefold ministry has to do. But nothing could be further from the truth. The leadership offices, the, the fivefold ministry, have one job to help mature the saints so that they, so that we as the saints, as the church, can do the work of the ministry. So verse 12 is talking about everyone for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. That puts responsibility on all of us. Only then can the body be built up. And when that happens, revival is the inevitable result. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 through 6 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So this is just basically saying that we're nothing in and of ourselves. But our dependency, our sufficiency is on God. And when we realize that, 
that takes all the pressure out of I'm not worthy. That takes all the pressure off of, well, I don't know if my family background, this and that. Well, it doesn't really matter. It matters that you have been called, and it matters that as you start to step out of your comfort zone, that God is going to equip you, that God is going to give you everything you need. He's going to give you strength when you feel weak on a day. He's going to give you focus when you feel distracted. He's going to heal you when your body's, when your body's sick and when you're feeling pain and suffering. He's going to be there to be that healing virtue to flow through your body. He's going to give you whatever it takes. Our sufficiency is of God. Everyone, everywhere, every day is to enlist in his kingdom. Everyone, everywhere, every day is to be a minister. And it doesn't matter what your personality type is. We get caught up in this a lot. Introvert, extrovert, somewhere in the middle. I'm an outgoing introvert. It, it starts to get confusing. I have to kind of like break it down. And so like I, I'll, I'll fake talk to people, but I really don't want to talk to people, you know. And, you know, it's, I mean, that's, it's, we're really getting deep in these, in these personality types. But, and, and, and I'm not making fun of that. Everyone has a different type of personality, and, and it's okay. It doesn't mean that one's right or wrong. It's just we're all different. And to me, that's the beauty of the kingdom of God, and that's the beauty of our church. I love that we have such a, a, an awesome uh, difference of, of personalities and, and different types of, of people in our church. Um, but yet, your personality type or your family background or how long you've been in church, if you've been born and raised in church or if you're relatively new to church because we have a, a, a big difference in that too, and I love that too. We have some that are very unchurched and we have some that have been born and raised in church. But none of that matters or has any relevancy to what we're talking about today, which is being the everyday church. We all have responsibility, no matter what your personality type is, no matter how long you've been in church, no matter what your family background is. If you are, you know, 28th generation Pentecostal or if your parents were atheist and, and didn't even believe in God, if, if, if you're here today and if you're trying to pursue a relationship with God, you have responsibility. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 says, but now have God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath, has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. So we have a lot of different members of our body that makes up one body. Verse 21 says, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. We all need each other. It's not that one's more important than the other. And verse 23 says this, and I love verse 23. I, you don't hear verse 23 uh, quoted enough. And those members of the body which think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. So I want someone, I want that to register with someone here today. That if you feel like you're forgotten, if you feel like that you're unnoticed, that is so far from the truth. God knows exactly where you are. He has a plan for your life. He wants to accomplish amazing things. He is raising you up as a leader in his kingdom. And it's important to understand that. It's important for you to know that you matter. You matter in God's economy. It means that you are vital to the kingdom of God, that we cannot do this without you. It's important to understand that, that God has called you with a purpose. So this God idea almost got derailed in the first century church, this, this um, everyone getting involved and, and the everyday church idea. It almost got derailed in the first century church. In Acts chapter 6, I'll expound on that. In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration, or in other words, the daily distribution of food. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of, dis of the disciples multiplied. So you see what's happening here. 
they're empowering others, they're discipling others. They're, they're not just saying that it's just going to be for just the disciples or just a, a, a select few, but hey, you, you, you want to come? C- come on, come get involved. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were ob- ob- obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among them. So God's idea of letting the leaders have liberty to lead resulted in a great revival in the first century church because everyone enlisted. We're talking about everyone. So there wasn't certain ones that kind of said they wanted to stay on the sideline and not get involved, but the the disciples and the, the ministers in the first century church were saying, hey, Come on in, man. We've got an awesome thing going. Look, you've got some gifting. I know God's called you. Man, yeah, your personality's a little different than mine, but you can reach some people that I might not be able to reach. So come get involved. Come step up. Let God use you. And it was amazing what started to happen. But one of the men, so this is the the derailment that I referred to earlier, one of the men that the apostles invested in and trusted eventually turned against them. Secretly at first, but then openly. And finally, his attitude became a cancer that infiltrated parts of the body of Christ. His name was Nicholas. He was one of the Gentile converts from Antioch. By the end of the first century, Nicholas's doctrine and followers had polluted two out of the seven churches of Revelation, and his spirit still exists today. Nicholas is laughing at the church from the grave. To the church in Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, this is Jesus speaking, says, But this is thou, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, or this, this mindset of Nicholas, which I also hate. This is Jesus speaking. And to the church in Pergamos, Revelation chapter 2, verse 15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Nicholas taught two false doctrines that negatively impact the body ministry or the, the community or everyone unifying the entire body to get them involved. He, he taught two false doctrines that negatively impact this body ministry that the church is supposed to have. And so I want to share those with you here today. The first one was Nicholas was a Greek dualist, teaching that Christians could have spiritual experience on the inside but not be affected on the outside. So his followers' uh, constant refrain was, we are not under the law, but we are under grace. Never realizing that grace is a higher law than the law of Moses. It's not an excuse to avoid God's commandments. Grace just basically wraps it up in a whole different way uh, for for our modern-day Christians and is an even higher level of commitment. It's not a lesser commitment or it's not something that we can do less of and still, uh, still be called but it's asking for more of us. This teaching of Nicholas robbed ministry of power. It robbed ministry of power. In a way, it just kind of jerked the rug out from under the ministry and the calling, the plan that God had for the first century church. Then the second thing, Nicholas didn't like doing the everyday work of the church along with the other men appointed in Acts chapter 6. He thought the apostles should be responsible for that while he and his followers were free to indulge in whatever lifestyle that they wanted to. So this, again, goes back to that everyone, everywhere, every day. The, the teaching of Nicholas and, and the mindset that, that he tried to convey to people and to impose on people was that kind of like delegating in a sense. Okay, well, the, the pastor does that, the assistant pastor does that, the, uh, the youth pastor does th- this and that, um, the worship leader does this, and we have certain people in the church, the church staff does this, and I just kind of come to church, and I just, you know, I'll kind of do a little something here or there every once in a while, but mostly it's their responsibility. They're the ones who are responsible for this. This was the teaching that Nicholas uh, imposed. He imposed this idea that there was division between the leaders and the laity and that only the leaders should be involved in ministry. And so what was the result? Well, it crippled the church. It crippled the church. It hampered the plan of God because he couldn't pull, they couldn't pull everyone in. In In both cases, Nicholas robbed people of their commitment to an apostolic lifestyle. He robbed uh, the church of power and he robbed the church of people, and ultimately a commitment to an apostolic lifestyle. Without ministers, the church is crippled at best or totally immobilized at worst. So my question today is, do we believe this? Is this our mindset? Is this 
Is this how we think? Maybe we don't, we don't think of ourselves as someone who's trying to undermine the church. I don't think anyone here today is, feels that way. Um, you know, maybe it's not a, a devious thing where we're, we're trying to go behind the scenes to, to tear down the church. I don't believe that that, that exists, so I'm not wanting to approach it uh, with, that, with that type of approach. But at the same time, we can fall prey to this, this way of thinking, that uh, delegating and, and putting the responsibility on someone else. But the fact of the matter is that everyone has a purpose, and it's POL's goal to help you discover what that purpose is. The body serving in unity is also vitally important. Ministry is not just the pastor's job or the staff's job. It's everyone's job. It's our job. It's, and, and it's not just when we're in the church building or on the church campus, but that responsibility stays with us. It goes with us every day. The calling of God doesn't take a break. The ministry doesn't take a break on certain days because the ministry's tired and so, okay, since, we're, since I'm tired, then you can, you can just take a, a day off. No, ministry is a responsibility and it's something that we are called to do each and every day. And it's my prayer that we never fall into the trap that the ministry are serving is only for a select few, when God has so clearly directed and commanded the entire church to serve. Everyone was commanded to be the everyday church. Everyone, everywhere, every day. I often tell people when I, when I pray with them that I don't believe they're here by accident. I don't believe they're, they're here by coincidence or just out of habit or routine. I, I I say that a lot, and I, I don't say it just as, uh, just as something to say that sounded good in the moment. I say it because I believe it. I believe wholeheartedly that we are here today, that like we as in each and every one of you that is sitting in this sanctuary, you're not just here because we just changed the church schedule, and now we have to be here for 9 o'clock if you, you, know, you want to hear this particular uh, part of the, the service schedule. I believe that each and every one of you are here for a divine purpose. You are here because there's a plan of God that is being unfolded in your life, and this is just another step in that journey. This is just another stepping stone toward you pursuing the plan of God being played out in your life. And when we think of it that way, it changes everything. It changes us. It gets us out of the mindset. It, it, it breaks that mindset of routine, and it breaks that mindset of just habit and, and almost like a robotic way of going through life because sometimes I can speak for myself that I do that. I feel like I'm a on fire for God robot, not saint. You know, that it's, you know I'm, I'm just kind of going through the motions. But when I understand that I'm, there's a specific reason for why I'm here. There's a, there's a specific reason for why I come to the altar on a particular Sunday or Wednesday. This past Wednesday, for those who weren't here, y'all, you could have come to church on Wednesday night and just thought, ah, you know, Wednesday night service, let me hurry up and, you know, got to get the kids to bed early and, you know, I was tired working on my 11 acres and, whoo, I'm tired, you know, and hopefully I'll have enough strength to brush my teeth tonight and all that and, but, but you could have that mindset. But for those who were here Wednesday night, and Brother Brian Johnson speaking, y'all, the power of God, the power of the Holy Ghost swept through this place. And anyone that was routine-oriented, that went away. Instantly, I was caught up in the moment. I'm going to be honest with you. Instantly, you could just feel the manifest presence of God, and you could tell that there was ministry moments popping up everywhere, and healing was going forth, and deliverance, and, and restoration was going forth. And that was just on a Wednesday night. But this is what I'm talking about. This is, there's, everything has a divine purpose, and we've got to approach it from that way. He's created each of us with special gifting, and he's calling us and wanting, us, and wanting to set us up to use that gifting to impact our lives. What are we going to do with that calling? Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark, forgetting those things which are behind. So Paul's talking about pursuing that calling. And I firmly believe that there are people here today that feel that calling. You feel that tug of the Holy Ghost. You feel that tug to step out and become the man or the woman of God that you feel called to be and use the gifts that God has placed in you. But there's something holding you back. 
It may be fear. It may be doubt. You may be doubting yourself. You may be doubting, was it really the voice of God? Is it really the calling of God? Or is it just something that I'm just kind of doing on my own? Those, we've all had those thoughts before. You know, was it, is it really God that's leading me here? It may be bad decisions that you've made. You've, you've, you've messed up. We've all been there too. It may be trauma that you've experienced that was out of your control. Now, this is a big one, y'all. For those that don't realize that this is running rampant, people who have gone through trauma, family trauma, relationship trauma, things that have happened to them that have impacted their lives, that, that have just completely altered their lives, and they're trying to find that place of happiness and peace again, and trauma won't let them do it. It's too much baggage. It's too much that they're carrying. And this may be why someone here today is not stepping out. It may be seeing other people around that you think are more capable. We've all done this one too. You know, you think of whatever it may be that, that you're wanting to step out and do, but then you know someone else in the church or someone else across town that's doing it, a friend or, or a family member, and they're, oh, they're way better than me. They're way more talented than me. They're way more gifted than me. And so we talk ourselves right out of it because we think that we're not worthy because we don't have the, everything that's required to step up. We read Philippians chapter 3 and we try to heed Paul's words, but it's easier said than done. It's hard to take those words and put into action. It's easy to say them, but it's hard to actually do them. And it's much easier to stay on the sideline and not get in the game. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, but we find it hard to forget, forget about our trauma. We find it hard to forget about the bad things that have happened to us. We find it hard to forget about the mistakes that we've made that make us feel so unworthy of our calling. We, we find a, it's easy to say, but it's hard to forget. It's hard to forget those things that have happened. I want to share another scripture with you that we're all familiar with, and I'm getting close to a close. Psalm chapter 23, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now let me stop for just a minute. All the days of my life, what does that sound like? What are we talking about? The everyday church. So God's not asking us to commit to something and then he's not going to commit with us. Remember we talked about earlier, God added to the church daily. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me every day and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So in one scripture text, Paul talks about forgetting those things which are behind. And I think we all understand the context that Paul's talking about. We're trying to forget about the things that would hold us back, our doubt, our fear, our trauma, our mistakes, all of these things. We need to forget those things and we need to look forward. Look at the plan of God. Look at what God wants to do in you. So we understand that context. Then in another scripture text, in Psalm 23, 6, it talks about goodness and mercy following us all the days of our lives. Now I want to kind of give you a little different perspective here. Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, maybe representing those things which are behind. And while we struggle to forget the trauma, and we struggle to forget the mistakes, and we struggle with that feeling that we're not worthy, what we actually too often forget when we're trying to forget the things that are back there is that goodness and mercy has been there every day that you wake up. Goodness and mercy has never left you. Goodness and mercy has always had your back, has been there in the good times, has been there in the bad times, in the busy times, in the times when you're struggling, in the times when you've lost your job, in the time where you feel like you're losing your family, when you feel like you can't go on another day, when you feel like you've messed up, when you feel like giving up, when you feel like throwing in the towel. All of those days, all of those seasons of your life Goodness and mercy has been there every day because we serve an everyday kind of God, a God that will never leave you, a God that will never forsake you, a God that says, I have called you, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to be there every step of the way. I'm going to equip you. I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you encouragement. I'm going to give you everything that you need. So step out. And I want to encourage POL today. I'm going to ask us to stand right now. My message of encouragement today is to take a moment in your life and turn around and look back. But don't look back. It'll be very easy. You're going to have some things when you turn around. Boom. There's the trauma. Boom. There's the mistake that I made. Boy, that was last week I did that. Boy, I had that moment at work and whoo, you know, I surely can't do anything in the kingdom of God now. That's a trick of the enemy. I bind that right now in Jesus' name. 
That is the enemy wanting to tear you down because the enemy's worried about y'all. But when you turn around, I don't want you to see all those things. What I want us to see in tomorrow morning when we wake up and start our work week and, and as we go in the weeks to come and as we d- do a deeper dive into this uh, learning how to become the everyday church, I want us to, when you're having a bad day and, and it's like, or when, you know, just something, fe- a feeling comes over you, it could be out of nowhere. This happens with trauma a lot of times where just, you'll just have anxiety come over you and you don't even know why. I hear people say that, that it just, f- these tingly feelings and all this just comes over you. This is what I want you to do. I want you to stop what you're doing in that moment. I want you to shut it all down. And and figuratively speaking, in your mind, close your eyes, and I want you to turn around and look and say, oh, my goodness. Thank goodness. Goodness and mercy. Thank the Lord, Jesus. You are there for me. It's right there. It's right there to have my back because we serve an everyday kind of God. He's not going to leave you. He's going to be there for you. And so I want to encourage people here today. We're coming to a close, and and we're uh, going to dismiss and have a a little time, a little bit of a break. But I I hope that today has, has ministered to you and that it will encourage you. I'm telling you, we have an amazing church, and each and every one of you have a vital part in that. And so I want to encourage you step out don't be afraid don't be scared I was scared to death to come here today I'm gonna be honest with you going to church this morning was different than than other mornings I wasn't relaxed I had all the 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 knots in the stomach but this is that's where God wants us God wants to push us into places we're not comfortable and that's when God's gonna start using that's when we're gonna start developing leaders and then you know what's awesome the last thing this is this is the last thing I'll leave with you so once you feel like you're discipling yourself and you're starting to step out you know what God's gonna open a door for for you to start discipling someone else. So it's gonna start spreading like wildfire and then you can say, you know what? I'm really uncomfortable, come hang out with me. No, no, I don't wanna do that. No, no, wait a minute, just get over here. Wait till you see what God does when you come over here, when you start taking that step of faith. That's what we're gonna have. Do y'all believe we're gonna have awesome revival? In Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus. Thank you all for being here for the 9 o'clock service. We encourage you, if you have children, if you need to go uh, get them, feel free to do so. Take a break, and we're going to look forward to God's move in the 10 o'clock service.